Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Fantasy Knuckleballers. Uh, you're hosted here by Rich and Aaron. And uh, today we have something a little bit different we wanted to explore. And it's basically being the Reds GM for the year. What are we going to do now that we are the Reds GM? And, Rich, I think I'll let you start this off. Sure. So, basically, we're, we're doing a thought experiment, and it is that – we have been signed on as the GM president of the Cincinnati Reds, given complete control with one caveat, and that is we have a budget of $130 million. Uh, last year, the Reds spent on the 25-man roster right at $122 million. So we don't have a lot of wiggle room, so that's going to inform our decisions on what we do going forward. So just to get get it started to kind of give a brief overview of what happened last year, the Reds were 83 and 79, not bad. We had a plus 29 run differential. To be a playoff team, we've got to get around that 89, 90 win mark, and we've got to get around that plus 60 or 70 in runs. Um, right now, going into 2022, we have a committed budget of right at 111 to 112 million. That's re-signing our players um, and and keeping most of them. We're going to lose Nick Nicholas Castellanos to free agency. That that's a fact. There's nothing we can do with it. Uh, we do have the option of bringing Tucker Barnhart back. He has a seven million dollar option for 2022. We can either sign him to that contract, let him go. For 500k, or we could possibly renegotiate and sign him to say a two-year deal at four or five million. On the pitching side, we have an option on Wade Miley. It's a club option for nine million. We got to make that decision whether we bring him back. Um, that's on our starting pitching side. On the relief pitching side, we've got I think Mike Lorenzo. We're going to lose him. Possibly he's a free agent. Do we bring him back? Um, and, but just to kind of go over some highlights of how we did last year on offense, the Reds were really good. OPS was 759. We were tied for second in the National League with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Runs scored. We scored 4.85 runs per game. We were fourth in runs out of 15 teams. If you look at the three teams that were ahead of us, they're all in the playoffs right now. It was the San Francisco Giants, the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Atlanta Braves. So offensively, we're a good team. We had two of our big players out last year. Mike Moustakis missed like 110 games. Nick Senzel missed over 100 games. He's a wild card. We don't know what we got. But offensively, we got, a, got most everybody back. Starting pitching, our ERA as a starting pitching group was 4.03. We were seventh out of 15 teams in the ERA. We were first in innings pitched out of our starting staff. The only person not coming back possibly, and we have that option, is Wade Miley. We also have two youngsters coming up. One is Hunter Green, and the next one is Nick Lodolo. Both those guys were at AA and AAA this year. Hunter Green is definitely going to be in the rotation fairly early. Nick, Nick Lodolo might have to prove it a little bit longer. So we're looking at possibly even having a better starting pitching group next year than we did this year relief pitching this is where we really need a lot of help our relief pitching was 4.99 era out of 570 innings we were 13th out of 15th in the national league in relief pitching pretty much every one of our guys some of our guys had career worst seasons um out of the bullpen just to name a few amir garrett didn't have a good season uh, we brought in the big lefty from New York. He didn't have a good season. And we'll go a little bit more in depth, Justin Wilson, but we'll go a little bit more in depth than that. Had we just had a league average 4.0 ERA in, in our relief pitching staff, 
we would have saved 63 runs or we would have been a plus 63 runs more than we actually finished our. That that could have taken us from 83 games to 90 game team and a playoff contender if our league pitching was at least league average. So just think about that, Aaron. Um, a couple yeah. of other things to think about is defense. Our defense last year was not very good. In fact, we were one of the worst teams in the National League in defense. Our, our, we were minus 34 and run saved, according to the Fielding Bible. We were 14th out of 15 teams in fielding. Uh, our biggest opportunities was in the outfield. We were minus 14 runs, center field, minus 11 in right field, minus seven in um, left field, minus four at shortstop, minus eight in third base. Um, we were one of the lowest uh, runs saved by teams doing infield shifts. The Giants saved 26 more runs by infield positioning, followed closely by the Braves. So if you look at that, defense matters to winning teams and our Reds did not have a good defensive run. Um, the outfield was minus 10 runs in the outfield positioning. We do have one, one minor league prospect that's going to come up, and one of the questions is going to be, what do we do with him? But Jose Barrero, he's a premium defensive player. He had OPS over 900 in the, the minor leagues. The question is, do we put him at shortstop, which is his – position that he's had in the minor leagues and he's been noted as an excellent defender or do we put him in center field where we have a black hole as far as defense it's just something to think about um the next two things to take into effect is really our management team do we need do we need to hire new defensive instructors um, for the major league team do we need new pitching coaches uh, our new relief pitching coaches what kind of changes do we need to have from a management standpoint? And then um, overall, our, our minor league team is in good health. The, the organization has done a good job with prospects. We're ranked 10th out of, out of 30 teams in MLB. We have four players in the top 100. We've got a couple other players that look really promising, um, including guys like Reese Hines um, and Ellie De La Cruz and Graham Ashcraft. Um, they're all players that look like they're going to be major leaguers in the near future. Uh, but just looking at the overall minor league system, I didn't see a lot of international prospects. The one guy that we did have was Jose Barrero, who came from Cuba and was a $5 million prospect. It didn't look like the organization spent a lot of money um, on international prospects. And if you look at the, the best teams out there, the, the teams like the Dodgers, the New York Yankees, the Giants, they're spending lots of money on their minor league prospects, even the Braves in the past. Because when you look at the number of minor leaguers that or the number of major leaguers that come for the minor leagues, I would guess it's at least 50 to 60 percent players that are drafted in, it, in the international draft. So that's something to talk about going forward. So now that we kind of broke it all down, do you want to kind of go through the offense with me? Yeah, let, um, if you don't mind, let's start off with some of the defense. It's, um, uh, there are some things there I wanted to uh, point out. So I agree with you, like the defense needs to be um, worked on, especially center field. Uh, I'll give credit to uh, Castellanos and Winker. They've both been DHs in their career, and they both uh, were vital parts to the outfield this year. And, uh, you know, they were key cogs to the offense. So, um, you know, being in the National League, um, you definitely ha had to have them in your lineups every single day. Now, next year with, you know, the DH probably being on the table, that will help out with uh, outfield defense quite a bit. Um, so that will give, um, I think that will help the overall, um, defense, but when you have Akiyama, um, you know, not hitting much and being hurt for 
what seemed to be like half the year. Um, he was probably your best defensive player in the outfield. Um, and like I said, if when you need runs, you can't. He he wasn't just he wasn't much of a run producer this year. Or, um, didn't get do much for getting on base, so they did struggle with that. And uh, they end up having to go with Tyler Naquin quite a bit, who who played had a really good year, but uh, he's probably not the best center fielder in the league. So I think with some of the hangups from Castellanos and Winker, uh, Naquin wasn't able to um, help them out defensively that much. And then, like talking about your um, infield there. You know, you're starting off the year with Suarez as your shortstop. I th- that did two things. One, it really lowered your overall team defense, especially in the infield. And then also, it really messed up uh, his uh, offense. He It took him until September to get right offensively for uh, Eugenio Suarez. Um I'm. I'm. Th- he's a good. By the way, he's a good l- by low target for uh, next year. Um, but like I said, he it took him to September to figure it out, and they they do have an issue going into next year with having Mustakas and Suarez. I you definitely can't move Suarez back to a uh, short. Um, you can't really move India um, because he's going to win Rookie of the Year. Or if he doesn't, then. Um, I'll be the first one in line to protest that decision. Um, so you got second covered, you got third base covered. Um, you know, there, there's really no place to play Moustakis, uh, if Suarez is playing and vice versa. Well, so you have a little bit of a glut there and you, you got to work it. You gonna have to work it out. Go ahead. You're, you're right. But if we do have the DH in the national league, I think, I think it works in the Reds' favor because you can put Winker yeah. at DH. You can put Mustakas at DH. I think you got to find out. Suarez made a lot of improvements in September. I think he had like eight home runs. His batting average was back to where it was. Can he be that player again? If he can, that can really take the Reds' offense to even. Uh, it can it can help replace uh, Nicholas Castellanos if you know if we're going to lose him. But I, you know, the question for me from a defensive standpoint is: Do you give Nick Senzel the center field position, or I, I don't? After the last two or three years, if if he's healthy, by all means, you could give him the opportunity. However, I don't. If you go into the off, if you go through the off season, thinking that Senzel is going to be planning on Senzel being your center fielder, you're setting yourself up for failure. Like he, you, at this point, he has to show you that he can be on the field for 150 games, because uh, to this point, you know he he hasn't showed it to you, and you can't you can't just assume it's going to happen, because you know the last two years it's it hasn't, and it's really cost them. Yeah, and I think the other question is. You know, Kyle Farmer didn't have a bad season at shortstop. He was pretty decent no. defensively. Um, he did he did better than expected as far as offensive production. I think the question is, do you give him the opportunity to be shortstop again and and use Barrio maybe in center field? I, I, I yeah, you know, I, that's a question. That's a good that's a good question. Um I think you do. I think after what Farmer did this year, I think um, I, I know hearing a lot of uh, Reds um, officials and management and alike talking about it. I think everybody's comfortable with what Farmer did this year and are pretty excited to have him at shortstop next year. And Barrio, like, I think that gives you the opportunity to you know, bring him along slowly. You know, you might start him off in the minors for a couple of weeks, but he can really be kind of a utility guy, um, playing short, playing second, giving some, maybe even taking some reps in the outfield. Um, he's, he 
didn't hit as badly as he did in 2020, but um, he still hasn't found his swing in, in the majors. So I think bringing him along slowly in the majors, um, you know, pl- you know, giving Farmer rest as he needs to. Farmer is not necessarily a spring chicken either. He's he's in his 30s. I think he's going to be 32 um, next next season. So it, he it's something you should probably plan for. And I, I do like uh, having Barrio there, you know, play, being a utility guy in the infield. Um, you know, in case somebody gets hurt and you can bring him along, you, you don't throw a lot of pressure on him early on. And I think that's probably the best way to handle him. You make sure he gets plenty of at-bats um, not to get into a funk or something, but I think that might be the best way to handle that. If And if that's the case, you know, assuming everybody else is healthy, I think your, in, your infield is probably set. You can We could talk about catcher as well, but I think the – I don't know whether you have to look anywhere for infielders in the off season. Well, you know, I, I, I agree. I think if there's any position that you're looking outside the organization, it, it would be in the outfield. Yeah. Potentially. And you're looking for me, looking for somebody that can play defense first. Um, and you can find those guys on the cheap. Um, there might be an in, Ender in Ciarte. I know you're not a big fan. He, he he looks like he can't hit anymore, but you could bring him in on a minor league contract or a um, million dollar, you know, major league contract, and he plays solid defense. Um, and he has the opportunity. He, he, he was a good hitter when he first came up. Yeah, I'll give you that. Like, yeah, you're right. I'm not a big NCRT fan, um, but. You know, like I said, he, you can't argue with um, – he, he does have good defense. And that may be all you need, at least initially. There's a, quite a bit of um, center fielders um, on the market. Here's a name to throw out to you. This might be a little early to be talking about potential free agents, but Chris Taylor for the Dodgers. You know, I would love him, but we only have $19 million to spend. Yeah. And um, I think we got other holes, and you know, yeah. like the bullpen um, that we have to fill. And I just don't think we're going to have that twelve million over four years, or even higher, that it's going to take to get somebody like Chris Taylor. What I do think we need to do is I do think we need to bring in uh, defensive coaching. We need to look at. Uh, whoever's at, whoever's working with the major league staff and our analytics on defense, it's not working. You can blame the players so much, and granted, the players are not good defensive players, but I, I'll give you my favorite team, the Braves. When Austin Raleigh came up, the knock on him besides he couldn't hit a uh, good fastball was he's not a real good defensive player. And since he's been in the majors this past year, there was talk about him being even considered for a gold glove and that he's a good defensive player now. So players can develop at the major leagues with the right coaching. And Ron Washington was a, is a great defensive coach for the Braves. I'm, you know, I'm wondering if our Reds don't need somebody like that to, um, to improve our defense. Yeah. It- Probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, I do know that uh, Del- Delano DeShields, uh, they, I think they brought him in to at least help with that and um, help with uh, getting players in the right place. And they have a lot of different coaches for uh, um, position, different position coaches. Um, but, um, yeah, like I said, I w- definitely bringing in somebody else wouldn't be a bad idea. All right, let's jump to the offense or to, to the hitting. Um, we've got just we got everybody back, or, or we got a besides Castellanos kind of review. Yeah, I think I think it's probably safe to assume he's not here next year. It'd be great if he came back, but I don't think that's something that you could legitimately um, count on at this point. Our, our our offense looks solid. We got 
Votto at first, India at second, Kyle Farmer at short, Suarez at third. He still had a 7-11 OPS, but has potential to be higher. You know, Mike Moustakis underperformed last year, missed 100 games. He's, he's a career OPS guy, you know, in the 740s, 750s, and he was 653 last year. I don't think he's done. I just think he was hurt. So either at DH or third base or second, he can help us. Um, we picked up a really nice piece from St. Louis. It's a minor league guy named Max Schrock. He had a 777 OPS and 122 at bats, but he's a 300 hitter in his career in the minors. Just had no place to play with the Cardinals. And I like him as a utility guy for, for the Reds um, next year. And I think, he, think he'll think he be a good performer for us. Um, you know the outfield. We've already kind of talked about that. I think the one question is on the offense is, do, do we bring back Tucker Barnhart? Um, yeah. He has a $7 million option, 500 k buyout. I'm I'm a believer in bringing him back, and I'll tell you why, and then I want to get your thoughts. Uh, it's not as bad. When you got a young pitching staff with the Reds do, you need that experienced catcher. He's a gold glover. Uh, he's the one position that we, you know, that we're saving runs at. Um, he's a guy to help bring up, help us with our young pitching. We've got one or two young guys next year that are going to be in our starting pitching lineup with Nick Lodolo and Hunter Green. You need that that base of a guy. Also with Tyler Stevenson, I mean, he's such a big guy. To expect him to catch more than 100 games next year is probably asking too much. You know, you still need somebody to catch those 60 to 70 games. I like him. I, for me, I say we try to renegotiate the contract, maybe do a two-year deal at four or five million a year. But what are your thoughts on Tucker Barnhart? Plus he's a he's a dirt dog. He's a Reds favorite, according yeah. to Jason. Yeah, I agree. Um like I said, if, if we could, you know, you know, redo the deal and do like a two two year nine million dollar contract, I think that would be the best interest for him and the Reds. Um I I I think Tyler Stevenson his um uh, his ceiling is really high, much higher than Barnhart, obviously. But you know, having somebody like Barnhart there as a mentor for a couple more years would not be a bad idea, and would give him the opportunity. It would it would allow him to um, ease into uh, the um, position and not throw everything in on him because I lot I know a lot of players. Um, will tend to struggle when they feel everything, um, all the stress and everything of, you know, being the man. So allowing them the opportunity to get their feet under them and establish themselves is important for a lot of these young players. And Stevens, especially young catchers, I think that's important. So I'm I'm there with you. Like, um, I think you've, even if you do the uh, one-year seven million dollar option, I think it would be money well spent. Um, yeah, I I agree with that. Yeah, I, I I totally believe we should try to do maybe a two-year four or five million. Um, but I I think he's a big part of the team. I think you know just to kind of close out on the offense. Tyler Stevenson's going to be a star. He's going to be an all-star. I think we both agree about, upon that. I think he can take a step up. We have Moustakis come back and just be Moustakis. Eugenio Suarez comes back at least partially the way back and hits 230 or 240 next year. And you can and maybe Nick Senzel plays all year and can show that he can play. You can see a scenario where we don't lose a whole lot, even though we're losing our big bopper, our, you know, maybe our MVP of 2021 and Nick. And, well, from an offensive, like, and I think we'll get to it as well. Um, you have to, you can, I don't think you can go into next season minus Castellanos 
and think you're going to compete. Like, he was such a huge cog in that offense that you're definitely going to feel that um, in in the uh, wins-loss co- column. You have to replace him, and you have to replace him with a position at somewhere in the position. Um, and maybe that's your center fielder there. Um, I don't think what I mentioned, Chris Taylor, would be that position there. Um, what do you think? Well, I actually think, you know, even though our offense might take a step, it, it might drop from second to fifth or sixth. I don't think offense is where we need to spend our $19 million that we have to spend. Um, I, I do think we possibly need to have uh, – we need to re-sign Barnhart. That's going to take at least 4 to $5 million and we – Probably do need a, a another outfielder that can play defense, um, but for me, I think we should be spending more on the uh, more on the the pitching side. I I am not disagreeing that uh, we'll we'll get to pitching here in a minute, and uh, I think Miley's contract is a big. Uh, uh, will be a big question there, but um, so the 19 million does that include um, the money that's going to be available once Castellanos is gone? Yes. Okay. That, that that's if we had Castellanos, if he if he resigned or stayed with his contract, we'd be almost at 130 million, and we would we'd be forced to be trading folks. I got here's a question for you. If you, like I said, it really depends on how the offseason goes. And I know there's going to be several teams out there that will be trying to stand the salary cap. Who knows what the Dodgers are going to be doing? Who knows what the Padres are going to be doing? But both of those teams, you would think, should be at or near whatever limits that they may have. Um, The Cubs might have money. Who knows? Um, I think the Giants might be one of the bigger spenders of the off season. Agree. Um, with that being said, um, there's a couple outfielders that would intrigue me to bring in more of a p- potential like one year prove it type of contracts. You might be able to get. Um, names. I'll give you. I'll give you three names. That I that I would really seriously consider. Um, this is assuming Castellanos is definitely gone and out of our range, which I I really foresee that being the case. One, uh, Michael Conforto had a really bad year this year. He's, okay. He's been known to ha- be a solid producer, um, but like you know, being a having a really bad 2021, he could. You know, settle for a a Marcus Simeon one year contract to kind of prove it and jumpstart his value. And any any of these players, you know, playing in GABP like um, should definitely do well offensively. Second player is Adam Duvall. He kind of a rejoining of the team, play right field. He's he's matched with the Braves the last two years. Um, definitely has some pops. He's getting a little older, but I definitely think he would. He might. He probably will be looking for a multi-year deal, but obviously he hasn't been getting one. Um, so I think he would do a one-year deal. And the last one is another uh, Atlanta Brave, uh, Jorge Soler. Um, I, he he's had periods of just flat-out domination, and then he's had you know periods where you couldn't find him with a uh, map. So I think all three of those guys would do a. Uh, a short-term contract, um, and I think they could potentially, you know, be a could be a spark for a uh, team like the Reds. I like all those guys. You could throw in Eddie Rosario as well. Another yeah. one. Um, Duvall does have a seven. It's either seven or seven point five million option. It's his option with the Braves, or he mm. can be a free agent. I think he's going to probably be looking for at least two years, but. I'm kind of with you. Conforto's 
a question mark, but he could be looking at a one-year deal. And so Lars, same thing, Rosario. The only thing, the, the only one really good defender, Conforto, I think it's considered maybe average or, or right around average. Duvall is considered a good defender. Um, and then Solar is considered a bad defender. But I like all those three options, actually. Um, you know, I think we'll have to table it and come back to that. Those are three good – those are four good guys, and I think you got to look – for me, you got to let the market play out. And we're going to yeah. wait and see which of these guys drop and where we can swoop in and get a bargain a lot like, you know, the Giants did last year with – let's say McGee in the bullpen. Yeah. Or uh, or the Marlins did with Duvall out, of, you know, in Atlanta. So I, I, I'm with you on that. Let's jump to the starting pitching. Is that okay? Sure. All right. Going over to starting pitching, this is really one we got a lot of question marks. We have Sonny Gray, Luis Castillo, Tyler Molly, Wade Molly, we have an option on. We have Hunter Green coming up from AAA. Nick Lodolo, who didn't – he basically got a got a cup of coffee in AAA. Didn't pitch a lot of innings, but they were great innings. And then we have Vlad Gutierrez. Um, if you kind of review it, going back, we, we talked about we were, we were league average. If you look at it, Sonny Gray underperformed. Luis Castillo underperformed. And they're our number one and number two. You can make the argument that maybe Wade Miley overperformed a little bit. And then Tyler Miley was pretty much what we thought he was. So when you look at that, we we were really lucky in that everybody was pretty much healthy for most of the year. We've got a $9 million option on Wade Miley is a big decision. Um, what do you thought? You know, we've got Sonny Gray really for two more years. We have a ten point eight six seven uh, million for twenty twenty two. We've got an option for twenty twenty three. We got Lewis Castillo. He is actually we got him for two more years under arbitration. Um, and then we've got we've already got one million committed to Wade Miley if we let him go. It's a ten million dollar contract if we keep him. What are your thoughts on on the starting pitching? I think for $9 million, after what Miley did last year, I think uh, it was definitely worth $9 million. Um, he he had an incredible year, I think, by any standard. Um, I don't necessarily think after a, a bad 2020 where he was injured most of the year, I don't think many people saw this. Um, out of him, except maybe some of the uh, his um, closest friends. The Reds um, did obviously because they gave him yeah. a two-year contract. Yeah, well, yeah. like gave him, yeah. But um, like I said, I I didn't see it coming. I didn't either. And, I'm with you. But um, I know he came out publicly and said that he wants to be he wants to retire a Red, and uh, he might be open to maybe a a three-year. Twenty-one million dollar contract, or maybe something along that line, so we might be able to get his uh, average value um, down a little bit. But I think even at nine million dollars, I think you have to you, you for the performance he did one year nine million. I think that's a low risk um, thing here, and you could definitely spend your money worse there. All right, let let me let me give this to you. So if we keep Miley at nine million. Yeah, we keep Barnhart at five. We're at 125 million. We've got five million to spend for the rest of the team. So it's just something to think about. For me, he had a great year. If maybe we can restructure that deal to be two years with nine million guaranteed or 10 million guaranteed. And maybe do something like six million this year with a three million buyout next year and yeah. an eight seven million dollar contract next year. I mean make it work out where maybe he could possibly get get more if he truly wants to be there. 
but I just don't see how we can go nine million. Plus, I mean, we we're, we're going to have Hunter Green. We got to make a decision whether we put him in the starting rotation or put him in the bullpen. But he's going to be up pretty quick. Well, we need him. I think I think you can say that your starting rotation day one, assuming everybody's healthy, is going to be Castillo, Gray, Miley, Malley, and Gutierrez. Um, I, you know, but the problem is of health. Um, there are always injuries. There's always, um, there's always injuries and there's always issues with, um, people during, throughout the year. You, you have to have more than, um, the five starting pitchers. And I think that's where Hunter Green and Lodo, Lodolo comes into play. Um, they're going to be there to pick up the ball once, you know, somebody goes down. And I, if you, I think if you go into the season with one of those two uh, penciled in like at, for your fifth or fourth or fifth starter, I don't know. I, I they don't have a lot of time in Triple A, and I don't I don't know whether that's going to be a recipe for failure or not. I, I I'd like them to start off the year in the minors if they can. I I can see that, and I actually can see you know where the starting pitching could be better next year. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, there is a there is a path for the starting pitching to be better, and then you bring Hunter Green up in May or June, and he becomes the number one, number two guy that we all expected of him when he was the number two overall pick. Yeah. Um. So let's table Wade Miley for now. I'm with you. You want to bring him back. I'm more on the so-so. We agree on Tucker Barnhart. So let's move on to the the relief the relief pitching and kind of review that. All right. All right. We got eight pieces of the bullpen back. Um, several of the guys underperformed, and I'll just mention a few. We know that we lost 63 runs compared to, say, the average bullpen. Some of the players that did that was Amir Garrett. He stuck it up. He had a six point. 1-7 ERA in 46 innings. I'm banking on a rebound. He, his ERA from 2018 to 2020 was 3.55 with a strikeout per inning. Justin Wilson, he's going to be back. He has, I believe it's a $3 million player option to come back. Now, he could always opt out. I don't see him opting out. He had a 5.29 ERA. But he's a career guy with a 3.42 ERA over over his career, he's a lefty. I, I think he rebounds some from that. And then you got to look at the guys that we had come up last year that did a good job. Luis Sessa That's a, had yeah. a great year, 2.51 ERA in 53 games. Tony Santillian, he only had 26 <laughs> games, but he pitched really well, 43 innings, 56 Ks, less than three ERA. We're they, really have- like, they really like him in the bullpen next year. I, I think uh, – there, there's high expectations for him in the bullpen. Yeah, we're going to have him back. I, I look for the rebound on on Wilson. We had another young guy that came up and did good. Art Warren over 25 games had 20 innings, 33, 33 strikes, had a 1.35 ERA and a less than one WHIP. Uh, he came out of nowhere. Uh, we're expecting a rebound on Amir Garrett, Lucas Sims. He really didn't have a terrible year, but his ERA as high as guy maybe gives up too many home runs, but his whip was solid. He had 47 innings, 76 Ks. We've got another young kid named Brandon Bailey. He's coming back from TJ surgery. Um, so it really, our losses are we've got TJ Anton is going to be on the injury list this year with TJ surgery. And then we've got Michael Gibbons. And it's a question mark. He was our closer at the end of the year. And Michael Lorenzo, who basically stuck it up last year, but has been a solid pitcher in the past for the Reds. Do we bring him back, or do we even consider bringing Michael Givens back? When you look at that, you can just say, if we just keep everybody, our bullpen's going to improve. But my take is we need three or four guys um, to help us out. We do have another young kid. He was in the minor leagues last year. He was Daria Moretti. 
He only had yeah. five games at the minor uh, at the majors, but at AA and AAA, he had um, a 1.02 ERA and a 0.75 WHIP. I'd love to put him in that in that mix. So we're going to have him next year. But you, you can look at bringing in some low cost bullpen pieces. I think we need at least three to four pieces to help out the bullpen. And I'm just going to throw out a team as an example of what you can do. Last year, the year before, the Giants were not that great a bullpen. They added, and I'm just going to throw out these names, and some of them you probably know, some of them you don't. Jake McGee, 59 innings, 2.72 ERA, 2.5 million. Jose Alvarez, 64 innings, 2.35 ERA, 1.15 million. Tony Watson, only 12 innings, 2.25 ERA, 1 million. Zach Lytle was a, a minor league pickup, 61 and two-thirds innings, 2.92 ERA, cost about 600K. Dominic, the 27 innings, 1.65 ERA, 1 million. Over those five guys, they got 225 innings. They spent about $6 million. And that that whoever was doing the scouting and the player development, they did a great job of adding those players. If we could do anything similar to that from a bullpen standpoint, we would be in the playoffs. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on the bullpen? Do we need to go big? Do we need to go small? What do we need to do? Um, do we put Hunter Green in the bullpen? Because that's, you know, one option is let's make him our Josh Hayer. Let's give him 90 innings in the bullpen and see what he can do. Um, I would be hesitant on that just because um, that was kind of the – what happened with the role of Chapman? Uh, they were trying to get him to be a starter, but he started as a reliever and excelled in the reliever. And then at that point, when they th- talked about making him a starter again, he's like, "No, I'm good. I'm, I'm a good closer." And he just stayed there. Maybe that's the best thing for him. Um, but I, I would like to exhaust the option as a, of a starter before I would transition anyone to the bullpen now granted if you know they have a need because of injuries or such um, in the bullpen and hunter green's there and um he's ready then yeah you could bring him up and uh but long term i would not want him in the uh bullpen i i want to i want to keep him as a starter i think the uh ceiling's much higher with him as a starter so, um, but I, I think Lucas Sims has about bounced back. Um, I do believe Amir. I do believe in Amir Garrett. Um, I'm not sure what happened to him. Just a little home run happy. Um, just maybe, uh, he was too much off season. Um, he, they were he. He had probably the most hyped um, off season of any Reds bullpen guy. And I don't know, maybe that got into his head a little bit, but um, like I, said, I, I would look for a bounce back next year for him. But um, you're right with uh, Tony Centillion and uh, Moreto, uh, Art Warren. Um, I would probably bring back Michael Givens. Um, he wasn't the best closer in the world, but he did do well um he did do well there initially and i think uh given the whole year i think he could he could potentially be the closer um out i would probably save the money on the bullpen and work and focus on the other areas um that's me but like i know you're kind of uh more into the bullpen and i can understand why but like i said I would probably i I would look for deals. I would look for some of those guys that you. I would scout a lot more, bring in guys that we could get on a deal. But I wouldn't necessarily commit a lot of free agent money to the bullpen. 
Tell me why I'm wrong. Okay. No, I agree with you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend a lot of money. I'm not going to be paying $7 million for a relief pitcher. I don't think we can do that being the, being the Reds. We're, we're a, a low market team as far as finances go. We have to look at, look at it. I think we're, you know, one of the questions I got for you is we bring Barnhart back. We bring Miley back. We're at 126 million. We bring Givens back. We're at 130. That's it. You don't. You can't do an offensive player unless we trade somebody. But for me, yeah. let's throw this out there to you, and then we'll talk about trades. Um, let me just throw this scenario out there. We keep Barnhart. We renegotiate with Molly, and maybe go seven million or six million a year for multi years. What if we move Hunter Green into the? I mean. Who throws 103? The last person to do that, and he doesn't do it anymore, is Chapman. He, the most dominant reliever in the in the past, what, since Mario Rivera? Yeah. So, to me, you could always bring him in kind of old school, let him be that part in the bullpen, and next year bring him into the rotation. But it's just a thought. I mean, if you're looking at saving money and how we can still get better, one option is put Hunter Green into that bullpen and let him get 70, 80 innings out of the bullpen, keep Miley in the rotation, and then you still, you know, have a little bit of money that you can spend, maybe seven million on offense, or I think you have to really look at possibly trading one of the pitchers. And there's two pitchers that people want. And you know who they are. I mean, it's going to be Sonny yeah. Gray or Lewis Castillo. So what are your thoughts on possibly doing a trade? And then also would you consider maybe not doing a trade right now? Let's wait to the middle of the year and see where we are and then trade if we're not in the – if we don't have a chance at, at getting to the playoffs or hold everybody and try to win next year. What do you think, uh, what do you think we should do? Not whether we are or we aren't. Should we be buyers or sellers? Should we be sellers? Because see that that to me that is the overall like one hundred thousand dollar question, and I'm trying to think of the team that they they had a good team, but it wasn't good enough to win the World Series. Grant, like basically the Dodgers or whoever the team was at the time, had a pretty high bar to set. But basically said, well, you know, if we're not going to win at all, let's tear it down and rebuild. And to be honest with you, I'm in that mindset. Yeah, like I think if things go right, some of these players have um, bounced back years. If the bull, especially the bullpen, if the bullpen gels together and have a bounce back year. And somebody steps up in the place of Castellanos. Sonny Gray pitches like he did a couple years ago. Same with Castillo. Uh, Wade Miley pitches like he did last year. Um, and all, you know, Sindel actually comes back and, you know, contributes a little bit this year. I think the Reds could, could, could be in a position like they were this year, competing for a playoff spot. Now, that's a big, long ways away from, you know, competing for a playoff spot and competing for a a title two different things unless you're under the uh under the impression that hey all you got to do is get in and then who knows what happens i i'm not of that mindset i think the dodgers had a legitimate chance this year now i don't know what happened to the padres but i think they had a legitimate shot at winning it they had a team good enough i don't see the reds team being that good and so from that perspective I would be selling. You know, you, you, they didn't have enough money last year to keep uh, Bradley and uh, Iglesias, and they they did this back in the last time when they went to the playoffs. They should have tore it down immediately and uh, traded Cueto and Leak and the rest of them, but they didn't. They held on for one more and one more, and by the time it was all said and done, they – try to tear it down a year or two too late and I think it cost them a year or so in the rebuilding process. So in my opinion, I think you should you need to be ahead of it. Um you could probably get a good um you could probably get a good return for Sunny Gray and Castillo Castillo right now. 
Um, you could probably you can't do anything with Suarez probably or Mustakas. No, uh, just because of their down years. But I think by mid year, I think at least one of them should have value. Um, Winker, I love Winker to death. He's a you know homegrown guy, but like his value is really high. If I could, if I could get really good studs for him, I would trade all three of those guys. You know, some of those players I would probably keep, like Barnhart. Uh, you know, resign him just because having a young pitching staff stuff that we've already talked about. There's value there. Um, even you know, with My- Miley, he has a very team friendly contract i would definitely resign him and you know think about you know either pitching him or trading him so so my question to you is do we trade one or two of these guys to get talent back now to win or do we blow it up and we're looking for prospects or a mix and mash i mean somebody like lewis castillo i mean he look he's a perfect or even Sonny Gray, they're both good fits for San Francisco. Yeah, and you could—they probably... have the rest of the Reds' freaking pitching staff from. <laughs> they do, <laughs> and and they have the prospects, the kind of guys that you want back. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm just the. You, if you're gonna tear it down, do you tear it down all the way? Or are we just looking to make one or two trades to free up? I mean, you trade Sonny Gray, you trade Castillo. You're looking at probably saving seventeen and a half million this year that we could spend elsewhere. We probably could go get a center fielder if we had that money and get some players back. Or are we looking, you know, more of a long term approach? And I think as far as Suarez, I think if Suarez comes back. I think his contract's so friendly, you you could possibly sell him. If yeah. it's out hot and hits 270. I think Mustakis's contract is so bad. I think we pay him 18 million this year and 16 next, or 16 and 18. 34 million guaranteed over the next two years. I just don't see anybody paying 33 million for him yeah. unless he goes out and just drops 40 bombs this next year. Yeah. yeah. I would trade all the guys that I could. The the only hesitation I would have with that would be Votto. Like I said, I, I feel bad for Votto. You know, well, not that bad. He's getting paid $30 million a year. But, um, you know, I, I'd love to see him get an opportunity um, to win a playoff series. Um, but with that being said, he, he's been great, and he still is great. He he would be kind of your uh, key veteran piece. But I would, like I said, Wink, um, Winker is 28 right now. He'll be 29 next year. Uh, Winker, Gray, um, Castillo. I'd keep India. Obviously, I don't know whether there would be a big trade market for Farmer or not. But I would try to build my core around India, Hunter Green, and uh, Lodolo. And that would be my core and start um, – what, as players that what about would, Tyler Molly then? Because he's basically we got two more years of Tyler Molly too. I mean, if you're breaking it down, you know, we've got two more years of three guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, but Molly would be one of those players that like it depends on the return. Like I don't know whether his return he's had one last year he it was a breakout year for him. I'll give uh if if the return was if I thought the ter- return was good enough, yeah, I would probably trade Tyler Miley too. But like, I, I, I would need a decent return for him as well. Um, yeah, I would. There was really nobody. I would build around those three players, and uh, I would try to bring in talent that was going to be maturing, uh, arriving on the scene in the next two to three years. Uh, I think if you did it properly and got enough pieces for each of those players, you'd have quite a uh, quite a nice core come you know twenty twenty three, twenty twenty four. You know, you really you could take the Miami Marlins approach and sell everybody, and then um, two you do one you do a reset, two you lower the amount of money 
that you have on the payroll and you use that money to buy international prospects. Yeah. Well, like I said, with Suarez and um, like I, I see Suarez and uh, Mustakas as kind of roadblocks as far as trading. I don't necessarily think you could get decent value for any of those two players. So, like I said, I would be keen, especially with Suarez. I think his value will come back next year. And once it does, I would be open to trading him at that point. Now, granted, if I, if, you know, a deal presented itself in the offseason, um, I would pull the trigger on it. Uh, I, but I, you're right about Mustakas. I don't think there's going to be a huge market for him um, this offseason. Um, you know, granted, you know, Milwaukee has been infatuated with them. Um, they might be, uh, at, at this point, I think with Mustakas, you would just try to get out of the contract. Um, you, you know, you possibly could combine him with either with, well, with Castillo, uh, Castillo, possibly. You might be able to sell him like that to, you know, um, a high payroll market, possibly. But otherwise, I don't. I think we're stuck with him. Same yeah. thing with Suarez, you know. And even as good a year as Votto had, we're stuck with Votto. Votto's never going anywhere. Um, even if we wanted to move him, he has no con- no trade contract. So we're blowing it up. We're going with young guys now. How do the fans take that? As a Reds fan, we were close to the. We were. We had a winning season. How many years has it been since we had a winning season? Um. I don't remember. It's been five or six, I think. Okay. We were close. Yeah. Would you agree that we were close this year? Well, we technically, we, we had a winning season this year. We were in the playoffs last year. So, it has, you know, it's been only one year since we've been in the playoffs. Okay. But are we sure that's not going to alienate our fan base by just – at least we have an entertaining team right now. Yeah, some really good pitchers. We got some really good players. We got a Hall of Famer in Votto. We got the Dirt Dog in Barnhart. We got a young rookie, Rookie of the Year, in India. We got a young well, star in Winker. I think the biggest uh, issue with the fans would be Winker. Um, everybody likes Winker, but everybody likes winning more. So you're saying we're going to bust out trading in pitchers, possibly look at trading Winker, and reboot? I, I know ownership is not a big fan of rebooting. Uh, obviously, from the last uh, time, last big playoff push in the uh, uh, few years back, but like I said, I, I think it's best for the overall team. Um, you know, you you can get some talent for those guys with two years on the contract at very team friendly rates. Uh, Sonny Gray, definitely a very team friendly rate, and you can get a lot for him. Probably not from New York, but uh, from a lot of other teams. So you're right; the Giants would probably be um, good potential trading partners. I would also, I, I do like the way the Giants handled the last couple seasons. Um, they actually um, bought prospects um, a lot of times over the last few years. And I I think more teams should do that, including the Reds. So basically they would take on a, a, um, a large contract from a team um, in return for getting a prospect from that team. And they did that several times. And I think that's a, if you have the money to spend, I think that's a genius way of, um, you know, collecting talent. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the problems we run into is we have a limited budget. I think if we freed up some space, I mean, I'll, I look at the Braves this past year. I really didn't like what Anthony Anthopoulos did in letting like somebody like Duvall go. But at the end of the year, we signed Jock Peterson, Eddie Rosario, Jorge Soler, and we basically got them for nothing, but they were all salary dumps. Yeah. So we took on 
I think I added it up like $7 million in salary and added like four outfielders. So it was all because we had the ability to take on that salary. And, you know, that that could be something that's built into our strategy and that if you have money at, at the midpoint in the season, there are bargains out there. Because we're in a we're in a market now where people are either in the thinking they're in the playoffs or they're selling everything and trying to add more pieces for later. I don't. It's a it's it's a good good scenario. I think I agree with you, though. I might would want to take more of a let's play it out half a season and look to make deals at the trading deadline. But I think you definitely have to explore trading. Um, the two big pitchers because they're going to bring the biggest haul. I think even yeah. Winker. You you can take you can go ahead you could go that route too. So like I said, there are two years left on the contract on, on those, you know, the two contracts in particular. How many does? Um, I believe Winker has two years, or he might have. It's either two or three. I don't know if so, he's an Arb four guy, but he has uh, arbitration two. This year and arbitration three next year. So no you could, free agent after that. So like look at the what the Indians did um with uh Lindor. They they traded they weren't in a hurry. They they let the offer come to him them and they took they got a really good deal for Lindor um because they waited and they were patient. Uh, I would be like I said, I wouldn't be in a hur- hurry to trade any of those but people but at the uh, GM meetings in December you damn well know that I will be sitting there telling uh, everybody that you know these players are available for the right price and let it come to me if if they don't get if they're not traded or if all of them are not traded that would be fine there's you know you have a whole up until July 31st uh, next year to uh, trade those pieces and you can even hold on to them for until next off season. Um, I wouldn't be in a rush to trade any of them, but if the um, if the right up the right uh, trade came along, I would definitely be dealing them. I got just a, I, I think I agree with you. I think we're in step. I yeah, I, I would. I, I would be really looking at. Um, it wouldn't be major league talent. It would be near major league talent. So like those guys on the cusp of coming up, probably. I would try to get – I wouldn't worry about being a top 100 player. Granted, if you could get some of those top 100 players, that would be great. But I would at least be trying to get a lot of um, uh, teams, like top 10 minor league prospects. Well, I think, you know, I've done a, a lot of deep dive in this past couple of months, and there are teams that really have a lot of young guys, international prospects they signed at 16, 17, 18. They're really on the verge of popping. I mean, the Dodgers have, I don't know, they've got so many guys. Um, the Giants are another team that has so many guys. The Cubs have some guys that are a little bit younger than that, but the Cubs have added a bunch of young guys too that are 17, 18 years old, 19, yeah. that, are, that are performing really good in rookie ball. Um, I got a question for you, though. Sure. sure. Are you buying into the 200 million plus contracts? And this all season, we got Javi Baez. We got no. Hey, I, Javi Baez Torea. will not sniff a 200 million dollar contract. Carlos Correa, Corey he Seager. No, he none of them will. No, Corey no. Seager probably has the best it's chance. Would you give any of them a longer than five year contract? So Corey Seager, Javi Baez, or Carlos, Carlos Correa? Yeah. No, absolutely not. Corey Seager probably has the best shot because a he's probably the best player of the bunch. Plus, he plays for the team with the biggest wallet right now, so um, he probably has the he probably will get a five six year contract. Um, well, I don't think it'll be two hundred million. Um, it will. He'll get a hundred plus million for sure, um, but yeah, the other two, Carlos Correa, I do like. He hasn't. I don't think it's clicked for him yet. 
in the majors. This but, year he's had a good year, but before, prior to this year, it's been on and off. I'm with you. I I, I like him. Javi Baez, I, I, you know, I if he gets more than a three-year contract, I'd be shocked. Um, he just doesn't he, – he has the power, but he, his average is poor. Um, he he doesn't steal any bases. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I. He's also uh, um, a pretty has a pretty big ego and a big big personality there that um, he uh, butt heads with a lot of uh, people. Like I said, I, Javi Baez definitely won't be getting a uh, five year contract, uh, but the other two could. With Corey Seager is probably having the best shot at. Would you yeah, give him a hundred and fifty million dollar contract? I if if the Reds, no, absolutely not any of them. I wouldn't do another hundred fifty million. But if you're the Dodgers and you you know think you can afford it, you know I don't I I don't know what they're. Let's say you're the Cubs. Do you give any of those three players one hundred fifty million? Well, like I said, I you have the money. If, if I was the GMs, no, I wouldn't be giving any of them the money. Um, will they get the money? I think they probably, at least, I think Corey Tigger and maybe Correa will get the money. But am I giving them money? No. I, I don't think it would be money well spent for those three guys. I agree with you. I mean, I look at the Francisco Lindor, and I'm trying to think, you know, everybody, you know, talks about what a good guy he is and teammate. And maybe it's just me, but I never considered him that superstar. Not like a Bryce Harper. I, I I consider Bryce Harper a superstar. I never put Lindor in that category. I don't even think I'll put him in the category of a Mookie Betts or a Trey Turner. I don't know. I, I'm underrating him. but And then he got $340 million over 10 years, so he's got the best contract of the bunch. Yeah, so with Lindor, I am a Lindor fan. Okay. Um, I I think he's probably a step below um, the Tatis and probably Machado at the time and Bryce Harper at the time. Granted, his contract, you wouldn't be able to tell that, but um, I think he's just a notch below those other ones, uh, in my personal opinion. Uh, he didn't have a very good year, but a lot of players that first year that contract it's usually so so. Um, but a lot of players usually pop that second year of that new big contract. So I think Lindor uh, would be an excellent buy low candidate next year, uh, assuming you can. You know, people are still projecting him based off of this past year's stats and not stats from two to three years ago. Uh, I think he's a, he could, he could finish the year in a top as a top 12, top 15 player, um, especially in the national league in the national league. I think he's definitely a top 15 player. So like I said, you could get a good value there because he might fall to the third round. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm with you from a, fantasy perspective that he could rebound but i'm just you know I, i'm not a big fan of the long-term deals and i'm i'm a yeah. team's paying more money i think our biggest problem with baseball right or one of the biggest problems is the some of the lower payroll teams they're not even spending close to what they should be spending i mean you can throw the pirates out there you can even throw the Marlins out there, though I do like their team that they're building. Um, there's several other teams. You could even say the Reds underpay, you know, from what what kind of revenue they generate. You could even look at the Braves. I mean, the Braves are very conservative on what they spend in regards to what they make. The um, Braves the, the Braves are the I guess the unicorn of baseball, in my opinion. They got I, unbelievable deals in both Albies and Acuna that is I, 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 I'm not even sure how 
it was even legal how the I'm, I'm surprised that the union hasn't stepped in and cried fi- foul on the deals that they got on both of those. They were very, very, very team friendly deals. And it's going to set, it's set, obviously setting the Braves up for a very long time. So like, yeah, they have, they have a lot of room to maneuver and they should be, they should be good for probably 10 years. And, you know, I really think the deal they got for Charlie Morton was really team friendly. I mean, they just re-signed him for $20 million. It's a one-year with a club option for a second year. It's not even a two-year deal. There's no way that he could not have gone out there and got a two-year contract at $20 million plus somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty – that's definitely club, club friendly. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I would do – so, like, if you – so, for the Reds, if they were able to trade Gray and Castillo and even uh, Winker, the one thing I would do is then – turn around and try to reinvest that money into Jonathan India uh, and maybe Hunter Green and Lodolo uh, and try to, you know, buy out their, uh, um, their arbitration years as well as, you know, two, three, four years of after arbitration. I think that's where it makes the most sense to spend your money. Um, especially if you, if you are able to free up some money by trading those guys and, bringing in some younger talents, go ahead and start getting some of that security now while you can. Yeah, I, I'm not opposed to that. I think with Jonathan India, I, I want to see a little bit more before I give him that big, big deal, just because um, he's a really good player, but I'm not sure he's a great player. Does that make sense? I, you know, I think yeah. 15 homer guy, he might peak at 20, but I'm not sure he's ever a 30 home run guy. Yeah, I think you could uh you could, you know, talk get that into the contract. Like I don't think you pay him like you did Acuna or something, but I think uh hold play on. third base, shortstop, second base outfield for the Phillies. He got like a six year, twenty four million dollar contract. And he's lucky that he's in the major leagues right now. Yeah, I don't think he went back down. Yeah. Can't think of the name. Shit. I think we all were howling because he had him on a death chart here. He took him off the depth chart, but okay. anyhow, um, he's the guy that. Um, granted, it obviously didn't work out for the Phillies there, but uh, it would be somebody that I would uh, try to do at least. You know, buy out his arbitration. Um, you know, get a couple years after that, and you get a lot more. Like I, I do like. I don't think India's ceiling is as high as many other players, but I do like his determination, his grit. He, um, I think the fact that um, you know he started off strong, um, he played well for several a couple months, and then he kind of hit a slump, and a lot of players at that point would just you know, crater until the end of the year and they figured it out in the off season, but he was able to kind of turn it back around and he finished the year on the high note. So like, I, I do like the fact that um, he was able to make adjustments um, during the year and uh, get better. So I, I do like his mentality and the way he is, uh, he's uh, put together. So yeah, I, I, I'm higher on him than I would have otherwise. Now, you make a good point. You could you could do the same with Tyler Stevenson and John. Yeah, Indian. exactly. Try to, try to wrap both those guys up, and that's that gives your fans hope. That gives them something to look look forward to. I mean, to me, I, I don't understand teams that don't don't keep players very long because how can a fan base root for people if they if it changes every year? I mean, you know, one good thing about the Braves is we keep our players. Even if you look at the Reds, you know, Votto is, is there every year. So if you were a kid in 2010, you're still rooting for Votto as an adult. I agree. And um, a couple, yeah, like I said, I, I do agree. Like, I think if you were able to do that, um, I think it would give you, give um, the fans a good sign that, Hey, these guys are here for a, 
a while and you can, you know, get vested in these players. Um, so we do some I, selling I, and then we try to sign some of our young guys to long-term deals. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would give players like Max Schrock the opportunity. I, I do like him. He has a good hit tool. Uh, but I think what you, what we, I, I don't think we'll ever get like this, but I think Tampa is the gold standard to kind of model after. Um, you know, you don't have to necessarily flip players quite as often as them, but um, at least always be uh, mindful of who's out there. You know, sign players as a as needed. Look for deals. Look for uh, potential trades uh, to make yourself better, like in the future and now. Um, I, I think that's the way, way you have to uh, proceed. And like I said, right now, I think getting rid of um, at least taking a step back, getting rid of your top talent, and then you know regrouping in a couple of years, and then you know always looking to get better, whether it's trades or um, some signing. But I, I, I w- I'm with you. I wouldn't be doing any um, six, eight, ten year uh, contracts anymore. Bado would be my last. Oh well, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't do them as general principle. I will give you my exception is is a situation like Vado, though I think the Vado trade has been and and you might make the argument that it's not, but I think it's been a, a bad trade for the Reds over the history of the trade, over the history of the contract. He has not been that same player. I think they signed him what two years before he came up um for a contract. And so by the time that his that 10-year agreement came up or whatever. He was not quite the same player as he was when he was an MVP player. Um, You know, I'm even looking at like Freddie Freeman thinking we don't need to give a 31-year-old player a 10-year contract, a Votto-type contract, maybe six years and let that be it. Well, I – I was probably in the minority when they signed Votto to that contract. I was screaming, "No, don't do it! It's not. It's not going to end well for anyone." And I, I, I was half right. I will say, like, yeah, his production definitely not worth thirty million right now. But I was expecting Pujols type numbers right now, like in. Pujols, as in like his last couple years numbers, but I'll give Votto all the credit in the world. He could have, you know, he's getting paid whether or not, regardless of what he performs like, and he had the um, fortitude and the um, will to basically reinvent himself over the last year, year and a half, and it's paid off. Like he is well outperformed any expectations for the club or probably even himself if he's honest with with you. Like I say, I I can't imagine I, I think the Reds got extremely lucky on giving a contract like that out. It could have ended a lot worse than it has. Um yeah, it has hamstrung the club as far as getting other talented players on the team, but you know what he's doing now is a testament on how good he is. I think he's definitely a Hall of Fame player in my mind. Uh, you may disagree with that, but um, the way he's been able to reinvent himself here in his, in his late 30s, um, I think it's a huge testament on like what type of player he is. So, like I said, it could have went a lot worse to see the Angels in Pujols, but like I said, it's not been that. So. You know, yeah, it's definitely hamstring the club and everything else, but it could have been a lot worse. Well, you you could make the argument too that he's worth twenty five million a year for the city of Cincinnati and for the Reds organization, um, for the franchise and for the history of the organization. And just from a marketing standpoint, everybody knows knows who Vado is. So, um. Yeah, I I get what you're saying. He works hard. He represents the Reds well. He's been a great player. 
He's probably going into the Hall of Fame. He's the king of king of on base. So yes. And it looks like Jonathan India is taking his is taking the king title. <laughs> Could be worse things than that. Uh, so you know what I, I'm selling? Are you officially selling? Or are you what are you doing as far as if you were I think honestly, my initial thought when I came in here today was to try to keep it together but i think you've convinced me i think i'm <laughs> a seller um whether i sell everything i don't know it depends on what i get for but i i, I think you're right i think it's the right long-term move all right sellers. so i'm in agreement with you thank you rich thank you everyone for watching uh like i said um keep us out there for your off-season questions uh email us at mvp at fantasy knuckleballers.com or check out our site we are going to be in the middle of updating it here uh updating our rankings and our uh our sleepers um so check it out uh, fantasy knuckleballers.com we don't have that it'll probably be ready by mid-december early january somewhere along there um and check us out on twitter at f knuckleballers and I appreciate you watching, and uh, we look forward to seeing your feedback. And you can feel free to click the like um, or subscribe buttons as well. Thank you. Braves tied it up. Peace, Aaron. Peace, man.